welcome to season two of the NGO Whisperer Show. My name is Caroline Opinde. I am the founder of the NGO Whisperer. We are a consulting business that provides technical support to nonprofits so they can successfully impact people's lives. Joining us today from Nairobi, Kenya is Dr. Elizabeth Waller. Dr. Elizabeth Waller is a health system strengthening specialist in Kenya. Dr. Elizabeth, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Caroline. I'm glad to be here. It is such an honor and a pleasure to have you and also to see you in good health, having contracted COVID-19 almost three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So today, Dr. Elizabeth is going to share with us her journey in beating COVID-19 and the effects of isolation on one's mental health. So Dr. Elizabeth, you contracted COVID-19 almost three weeks ago. Yes. What were the thoughts that went into your mind from the first time that you felt you had the symptoms, then you went tested and, you know, found that you tested positive? What went on in your mind? Caroline, first of all, I'm happy to be here to just share my journey and thank you for the good work that you're doing. Uh, my journey was interesting. Uh, number one, I first had symptoms maybe four weeks ago where I thought it was just the effect of fatigue and um, feeling like uh, I'd been going through so much. I'd personally lost a friend, a doctor who contracted COVID-19. And so I was uh, right in the middle of supporting the family through the grieving process and the burial and everything. So my assumption was after we came back from the funeral was that this is just exhaustion. And uh, because I often get, when I find myself coming down with a the flu, then it's usually a symptom that my body has been stretched beyond limits. So I attributed it to just general fatigue and the things that I'd gone through. And I remember I continued working uh, because we're doing a lot of um, Zoom meetings or online meetings, uh, that Friday, I think it was on 18th of July, I was, you know, huddled in my bed and I could barely go through the meeting. And I told my colleagues, uh, I can't do this. Let me just take a, a, a break. And uh, over the weekend, I was fine. Or rather, I'd taken enough drugs, I think, to feel like I was fine. And I remember I even went out for a function. And then um, come Monday, uh, a friend of mine whom I'd been with during the funeral wrote to us and told us, you know, uh, I went to the hospital because I was not feeling very well. And uh, she had samples taken to test for COVID-19. And that Monday, Caroline, the, the results came back positive. So because we spent quite an amount of time with her, two days nonstop, because of the travel to the funeral and back, uh, we decided to also go for testing. When I asked the people I had been with uh, at the time, they were also exhibiting similar symptoms. But Caroline, it's interesting because everyone was quiet about it. And uh, I think this is the biggest issue is that uh, the stigma we've created around COVID-19 uh, makes people just be, you know, be afraid to speak up when they're actually sick. So I was, um, when, when she told us that uh, the test was positive, I asked the other people whom we, we, we were with um, how they were feeling because I ex expressed that I was down with the flu, but I think over the weekend I felt a bit better. And that's when I found out that uh, the other people I was with were also down with flus, but they had also self-medicated and were up and about. So I organized for home-based testing. Uh, through a friend and we had our samples taken quite a big number of us and then that was on a um, Tuesday and on no that was on a Wednesday and then on Thursday 23rd of July uh, we got our results back and uh, interesting thing is that everyone who'd been around uh, that friend tested positive so the biggest issue for me was the fear one that um, I had just interacted with my mom who was who's ailing and is undergoing treatment and of course she's elderly also 
and uh, the space between uh, falling sick and the time for the results was around a week. So I'm even imagining how many other people I like, came up into contact with. And that's just because we don't have a very fast turnaround time for the test. We also have, uh, because it took very long for our friends to, to get our results back. So I was very anxious in the two days of waiting. I knew as a medic what a positive test implied. And um, yeah, I think nothing really prepares you for a positive test. So I did call one of my friends and I said, you know what, I need you to be here when I'm receiving this result because I'd been told what time they'd be relayed. And uh, when the results came, I remember I was having a meeting with a friend over something else and related. And I just saw, because I was using WhatsApp web, as I'm talking with a friend, um, I see the pop-up, so I open it. And I read and it's saying COVID-19 positive. And I continue talking like nothing had happened. Wow. So I froze, I was numb and I felt, I'm not dealing with this, let me finish my meeting first. So I finished the meeting very calmly. And then after that, I went back to the message. And that's when the reality hit me that you actually have COVID-19. You've interacted with your mother who's not feeling well. Uh, you reacted with a thousand other people. You have children at home. So all these thoughts were just flying around. Yeah. So with all those thoughts in your mind, you thinking now you have COVID-19 and the fact that you are a medical doctor by training and you are at the forefront of supporting the government of Kenya in addressing or responding to the COVID-19 pandemic in the country. Now you came back to yourself as a mother, as a daughter, as mm -hmm. you know, a woman who has a household to run. Mm -hmm. What plans did you put in place? Because at that point, we all know you need to isolate yourself. So what plans did you put in place in your household and the people that you had to take care of at that time? So uh, when I took the test, I met my, my house manager also test the test. I did make my kids test the test. Uh, I know that COVID-19 is not severe in children and I didn't want to subject them. It's very intrusive, the testing. Uh, so I didn't test the children, but I tested the nanny. Luckily, she came back negative. So in that night, what I did was uh, I had to inform my immediate family. One, because of the risk that I put my mom, mother to, and also two, that um, they needed to also support me. I am very privileged, Caroline, and like many, many other Kenyans, that I live in a house that has uh, an ensuite bedroom. And um, I also have space where, you know, the children, I, I'm able to actually self-isolate within my house. Um, so I relayed the news to my nanny. So, of course, she was very apprehensive, uh, but then she supported me throughout. What happened is uh, all the knowledge that I had about home, home based isolation went through my mind because, as you mentioned, I am all these other things before I'm a doctor. So the panic set in. I remember that night I didn't sleep at all. I learned later that that term is called somnophobia, where you feel you'd wake up dead. Um, so you don't want to sleep. Uh, the fear is real, having lost uh, my dear colleague to that. Um, the fear that uh, anything could go wrong, even though I do not have underlying illnesses. But that's just that one chance, you know, one in a million chance, you start feeling that one in a million chance could be you. There's also the fear of the knowledge getting out there. And um, we live in a gated community. So you can imagine the stigma that um, has been instilled, the fear of uh, people coming in with hazmat suits to pick you up in an ambulance. And so one of the things that I kept telling myself is you can't be sick enough to go to hospital. You need to just, you know, manage the symptoms and stay at home. Uh, and that became a battle of anguish because instead of getting better, you are worrying, you're worrying of a what if, what if, what if. So um, 
I have a brother who's a medical doctor also, and I reached out to him. So he came over the next morning, uh, brought in supplies for medical supplies for myself, and also the N95 mask, which, as I mentioned, I'm very, very privileged to have access to these things because not many people can afford an N95 mask. So that was for my nanny to manage to take care of me. And then um, also brought in the supplements that I required. I'm also privileged that I have colleagues who are managing patients with COVID-19 in hospitals. And I've just recently tried to get a colleague to get um, um, an ICU bed in one of the facilities. You may be aware that our facilities are currently full with not just COVID patients, but um, non-COVID patients. And so it's very difficult to get space. And so I called her up and I told her, this is what I'm going through. What should I do? So she, again, she reassured me and she told me just um, according to the supplements that had been given and the drugs that had been given to continue with them and to, and the danger signs to watch out for. Um, Caroline, it's, it's, I think, um, very sad that not many people have access to a health professional to tell them what to do. And I think that is what spurred my, my initiative to go public about it because we are quiet about this uh, issue we do not have enough messaging on what to do instead we have a lot of messaging on you you got covid because you broke the law you got covid because of this and that so that really is um a message of fear rather than of hope yeah so i thought um i gave i asked I requested my family that I'm going to be public about it because what, what I've realized is uh, COVID doesn't just affect you. It's everyone around you. So it's also courteous to let the people know around them, around you that you are going to take a bold step like that. So with their permission, I went ahead and started sharing my journey. That journey that you shared um, impacted so many people, not just in Kenya, but around the world. Right now, I'm here in Manchester. Of course, I know you from Kenya and uh, having featured you also in the NGO Whisperer magazine. But looking at Kenya's statistics, you know, right now we have, um, we've had 26,436 cases. 12,961 have recovered and there have uh, been 420 people who have lost their lives, including a dear friend of yours whom I also knew from the University of Nairobi, the late Dr. Doreen Lugaliki. So looking at these statistics, of course, there is fear that comes with it, especially when you look at other countries like the United States, which have very high numbers of people, you know, who have, uh, who have contracted uh, the disease and who have died also. So right now, for those of you who may not know, there are 19.9 million people, uh, cases uh, of COVID-19 in the world. 12.1 million have recovered, which is great but still we have lost 732,000 people to COVID. And that 732,000 could be one of us. And that's why the fear is real. The fear is real, the stigma is real. Now, going back to your channeling, which I found to be very, very, um, uh, it, it was very personal because you are sharing very personal things, your feelings, your fears. You are sharing uh, things about um, how your household is run. I remember one moment you even shared how laundry is done at your house, your laundry being the patient, the COVID-19 mm -hmm. patient. These are things that we don't talk about every day on social media. So. Mm -hmm. You dubbed it my journey with coronavirus, posted it on social media. I follow you on LinkedIn and on Facebook, and I could see your posts every day. Up to now, you are still uh, posting it. And so in, in, in your view, has this been helpful in, in eliminating or contributed to eliminating COVID-19 stigma based on your experience and 
what you have done so far? Yeah, so the documentation, I think for me being, um, it was one of my coping mechanisms because I'm a writer, I express myself in words, I try to put down my emotions on paper. So for me, it was very relieving in terms of helping me just articulate what I was going through. Initially, I just thought, let me do this for my own coping mechanism. But it turned out that um, quite a number of people, you know, reached out or drew strength from it. I was surprised I was being called by even a, there's a policeman who reached out and said, look, I don't know what to do, but I'm following your story and you're encouraging me. I got many health workers um, saying, the, me too, I am in isolation, I'm in day this and that. Uh, those who'd gone ahead uh, were giving me, sorry for that, Caroline. Those who've gone ahead were giving me information on what's, how they coped. So it really, really helped. Now, I had moments of uh, anger. I had moments of um, pain because it is COVID-19. The symptoms included, uh, for me, it included joint pains, fevers, chills. And one moment you're fine, and then the next moment you're down. So we, it was therapeutic. At some point, I was really like, what am I doing? Do I really have to put my life out there? Um, but then I saw the feedback and the encouragement that people are drawing from me. I remember, Caroline, one of the stories I put up. So um, non conventional media houses decided to pick the story of one of the articles I was writing and, um, you know, basically put out their own story. And then I said, no, I'm, I'm not going to let them write their story for me because I know how it happened with my late colleague, Dr. Doreen. I mean, um, her journey with COVID was totally taken um, out of context. Her personal life was put out there and it was not nice. So that story from the non-conventional media uh, was brought into the, our estate WhatsApp group. So remember I had mentioned that um, I was not sure how the estate was going to receive it. And I sat, I froze actually when I saw someone posting the story. And then, you know, the way you see someone typing for a long, long time. And I was like, okay, um, this is my defense, quote unquote. I'd already come up with you know, an explanation onto, you know, this and that and that, and I'm isolating and I'm not putting anyone in harm's way. But I was pleasantly surprised, Caroline. Um, the person who shared was like, kudos, Dr. Wala, you have, you have really been brave to speak up. There are many who are walking this journey, but afraid of the stigma and um, uh, generally just saying um, they were proud and that they were supportive as a neighborhood. And that if I needed any supplies, they wanted to, you know, come in with fruits and whatnot and concoctions that had been given. So it meant that um, you just needed a spark to light a fire. And I think people are looking for hope, Caroline. People are looking for hope. We've spread so much terror. We've spread so much information about death. But that's the first thing you think about when you receive your positive results, even for the ones who don't have symptoms. The first thing that crosses their minds are, am I going to die? So when you look at the scientific side of the risk of uh, COVID-19 uh, mortality, that is people dying from COVID-19, it's like three to four percent. It's not very high. Um, and even the, the, the death rate, is higher on with people who have underlying issues. Basically, the immunity is not able to fight off the virus. So I think uh, as more people come out, I was pleasantly surprised to, to read about more media personalities saying, you know, I have COVID-19 and this is what I'm doing. I think it helps to break the stigma. And um, I got 
let me just say, got overwhelmed by the support, by the prayers, by the messaging. At some point, I had to switch off my data <laughs> because I couldn't keep, keep up. I couldn't speak calls. At some point, I was very low. So as you say, uh, your whole lifestyle changes. Uh, I learned every single corner of this bedroom <laughs> because uh, this is the only space you're allowed to be in. And that was for 12 days. And um, I almost climbed my curtains because I'm an extrovert. So in addition to just the symptoms, which, which resolved in uh, maybe five days or so, it is the fact that you are a paria actually to society. And uh, no one wants to come to you. And I remember when I came out of isolation and I was chatting with my house manager and she was saying, even uh, the guys who are doing deliveries, I mean, the word had gone around the estate that my house number, you know, don't come next to it. My children told me how their their friends were were told by their parents, you know, don't go to play in that house. Um, so the stigma is is real, is real, and that I don't know how people who live alone are managing, or people who are not able to access, let's say, any other psychosocial support from family and friends. It's not easy. I think the mental anguish is what people struggle a lot with more than the symptoms themselves. So I had a lot of support also from my workplace. Um, luckily, Carol, Caroline, I have a good medical cover and they kept on saying, do you need to go to hospital? Because we don't think about it, we will get it covered. Um, and I'm lucky that I didn't require. I remember I told myself, do everything, do not get into a hospital facility. So uh, with with time and with the messages, with the sharing, there were times I shared about my frustration of thinking I am symptom free. And then you get this other wave of, of symptoms and that just takes it down because it means, okay, so I've, I'm not yet over the hill. Um, and so when I got like two days symptom free, I was like, let me cross my fingers because I really need to get up. So I was lucky that after three days, I saw, okay, now at least things have settled down. I don't have a fever. I don't have chills. Um, but how will people take me when I'm out? And um, it was interesting because let's say four days later, I needed to go meet someone because life has to go on. Uh, children have to eat. And I remember just because I'd gone public, it also meant that I have to tell people that I I've actually just come out of isolation because I, I, I respect people's fears. So I may be very confident in saying, in telling them the science is that after three days, you're more or less not infectious anymore. But I remember, no, but I respect people, you know, people's feelings because people are asking for a COVID test. And now it's no longer recommended because um, even a positive test does not show that you're infectious. It just shows the virus is shedding but it's not replicating. So I, I chose not to go for a second test. And um, when you tell people that, you just see them, you know, cringing a bit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but but uh, it, it's been interesting. It's, it's, it's really put me out there, being in the policy space, that it's very easy to put down guidelines. It's very easy to say, do this and do that. And then you're placed in a position where when you look at the guidelines that you've put down, it's, it's possibly impractical in maybe 80% of the families in Kenya. Yeah. So maybe, yeah, maybe it was, um, for, as they say, for such a time as this, that uh, we are able to influence policies that really can speak to the person who has the least of resources. That is really great. When you look at policies, as you said, uh, drafting policy is very different from implementing policy and also from implementing policy from the point of your normal citizen who might not be privileged to have facilities to isolate themselves away from their families because for you, you had the privilege of 
having your own bathroom, but I'm thinking about Kenyans who live in um, in informal settlements, for example, which is the worst case, where mm -hmm. someone has to isolate and they live in a single room with their family and they have to share the toilet and the bathroom with many other neighbors. How is isolation possible? And then again, you've talked about mental health. August mm -hmm. is the mental health month and mental health awareness is very important. And it's real. You have yeah. your worries, as you said, you have your fears, you're afraid of sleeping because you don't know if you sleep, you will wake up or you will just go and go peacefully in your sleep. So mm -hmm. share with us uh, a few things that you did uh, or people suggested to you, because I know I follow you on social media and people who are telling you, oh, Dr. Makove, you can do this and you can do that. And I saw you trying to do some yoga and you said as an extrovert, it was a bit difficult to just sit and do some yoga to, to, to relax. What mm. did you do to be able to overcome uh, the worries and the issues that were going on in your mind to the point that you were able to sleep at night when you previously couldn't? One of the biggest support system was the, the group of us that tested positive. We, we had already formed a WhatsApp group on, when, you're, when, when we were planning for the logistics of travel. So we continued sharing there. And every day we kept on checking on each other. In fact, one of us got admitted to hospital. Um, and that was very severe because she was asthmatic. So we kept on, you know, finding out how you're doing, what are you taking? And, and then there were the others who were very, not, not affected very badly. And, you know, um, one of them was running every day, she'd jog. And then there was one who would listen to music and she'd play to, to, to us and when we just wanted to cry when we just wanted to say you know what this thing uh, I'm not so sure whether I can deal with it um, when you post there you know you get encouragement I also had a group of friends who rallied around me and they so so what would happen is that I would get overwhelmed with the how are you doing how are you holding up you know my prayers because those are so many messages you just want to it takes you back to that space of uh, I'm, I'm not really well and people are really worrying about me. It's a good thing to get people to worry about you But then there's a place where you find it's too much. Yeah, and you just want to stay away from you know Your phone or whatever gadget you're using So like for them they organized themselves and they said look stop calling her We'll have one person check on her morning and evening and then she'd come back and report in the group and for me that really helped to save off the, the inquiries of tell me what happened and tell me what happened and it became a lot. Then the other thing was um, being requested to share my story on media and I wasn't still well, at least now I'm fine and I can speak about it. But I realized it was draining me. It was draining me and I didn't know. And as extroverts, you want to be out there, you want to speak but you don't realize you're burning out. And um, at some point when I had thought I was over the hill and then I went down again with the symptoms, I decided, you know what, first of all, I hadn't stopped working. I was still uh, putting in a few hours. And then I said, no, let me take a break. Let me give my body a fighting chance. Let me cut off um, a lot of news feeds. So I had special times when I'd plug into social media I did try the yoga. <laughs> the yoga helped with the breathing because uh, it, it has some breathing exercises. And with COVID-19, what you want to do is to keep your lung, your airways open or patent. Even the way you sleep, you're advised to sleep on your, on your stomachs. So I tried um, the people who try meditation, uh, people who try music. Uh, I think for me, the writing really helped. Uh, the sharing with the group of the small group of people whom, whom we were walking the journey with. I also got quite a number of guys who wrote to me and said, I'm doing this, I'm going through this, I'm going through that. So even my walking with them helps me to say, you know, to distract them, to calm them. Because like when I shared in our estate group, I kept on getting these things of, oh, I have a runny nose, could it be COVID? 
So people now became too much aware, which is a problem with too much knowledge. And any small thing, and, they, and I was telling them, you know, common things occur more commonly. So it could be just the, the normal flu and, 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 and things like that. Uh, people try prayer. What I found interesting, because I'm not very religious, is um, someone who wrote to me, and coming from a good space, and they said, you know, what, I'm praying for you, and they say, you, you appreciate the, the thoughts and the prayers. And they said, you know, by tomorrow you won't have symptoms. They wrote to me the next morning and said, look, I have a good feeling. You are fine now. Uh, you, you have done this prayer and whatnot. Not. So I said, okay. Uh, so how are you feeling? So I said, uh, I still have symptoms. And uh, then he said, I do not have enough faith. So I was talking about just being sensitive. Uh, when we are coming from spaces where we want we don't always have to say something to people. And sometimes some of these utterances, if I was someone who would take that uh, personally, I'd be very discouraged because what am I doing wrong? Why am I not having enough faith to, to get symptom free? Because this other person has assured me that I'm going to do this and that. I remember also um, someone writing to me and saying, how are you? And they said, I'm fine. And I hope you're feeling better. Okay, thank you. Then he says, okay. But you know, I'm selling this insurance cover for, uh, what is it? Um, life insurance. Yeah. Basically, almost saying, you know, you need to take care of your children in, the, in case you die. So these are the things that uh, people do from either an ignorant space or a just very insensitive space that may further worsen the mental health issues that uh, someone who's going through any kind of, of, of suffering, not just COVID-19, that sometimes we don't always have to say something. Sometimes we can just say, I'm here, let me know. If you need this and that, I'm at your service. And I had many, many, many people doing that. So just being sensitive about someone, um, also not uh, giving them space to heal, at some point, I had to switch off my phone because of the number of calls that are coming through because everyone wants to find out how I'm doing. And I think um, coming from that space of we are here for you, but then now going to the extra side of now it's just too much. You, you can't rest because people are worrying, rightfully so. And I think this worrying, as I mentioned, is coming from the stigma that we've put there where it is... Um, COVID-19 equals death, yeah? So we need to start giving hope. We need to, to stop criminalizing to, because there are people who are asking, um, so which rule did you break, yeah? And they were very confidently asking that. So it doesn't mean that we've said, if you have COVID-19, you've done something wrong. So it, um, it behoves us to be sensitive to, what uh, people who are undergoing COVID-19 are going through. And sometimes you don't have to say anything. Um, there's no checklist where I'll say, okay, these are the people who told me sorry, and these are the ones who didn't. You know, people just want positivity, positivity. Give them things, give them books to read, music, podcasts, you know, that they can do at their own time, if that's their thing. And then um, later, maybe now have conversations, yeah. You've shared with us um, your thoughts, what you went through and all that, and now bringing it all together. As a champion for health system strengthening in Kenya, um, you play a really big role together with the team that you work with at AMREF and many other bodies that you are, you are part of. You play a really big role in educating Kenyans and providing hope to Kenyans. What message do you have to fellow Kenyans on how to take care of themselves? And also from the point of view of a medical practitioner or frontline healthcare worker, what message do you have for them as they provide these services and still come back home to their families, to their children? How can we all come together and provide support to the country so that we can 
uh, eliminate this stigma that is associated with COVID-19, but at the same time, allow people to live life um, uh, at its fullest as it is right now with all the restrictions and the precautions in place, but also for people not to live under fear. That is a very important point. Uh, one is, uh, as a general public, it's important that we observe the protocols that have been put in place to prevent the further spread of COVID-19, and that includes uh, hand washing, wearing a mask, sanitizing, and basically social distance practices. But uh, one of the things that we have seen is that we are now at community spread of the virus meaning that um, even where you go to shop in the malls or the public transport you use or uh, you know the institutions you visit or at workplaces very likely that there's someone who has COVID-19 and maybe doesn't have symptoms and so it is um, I think we need to accept that now any case that's in the community is not necessarily because someone didn't wear a mask yeah uh, masks are not 100% effective, they really, really help, but they're not 100% effective. So acceptance that um, I think the disease is here to stay for a while, and uh, how do we mitigate its effects? How do we remove the stigma of, um, you know, initially it would be you call 719, which is a toll-free number where you can report people whom you suspect to have COVID-19. So that's already putting stigma around it. Uh, how do we offer support when we know someone needs isolation? Um, the contact tracing beat, I think, has um, has had. I think the, the the our government, our county governments, are overwhelmed because, like I mentioned to some people, uh, no one has ever called me uh, to find out. Because beginning, it was everyone is being called. But I think now the numbers are just in it. So I think it's now individual responsibility on if you test positive for COVID-19, what can you do? I think this information is not very widely shared because we are emphasizing a lot on the fear, the fear factor of stop getting COVID-19. And um, now when people get it, then they are undercover. They don't want anyone to know. They don't know where to seek information from. Um, so it, it becomes a double stigma because you're already suffering, but you don't know what to do. The other thing I've seen is uh, many people come with the typical symptoms, uh, the mild symptoms, and they just start medication. So no one is, so they're not volunteering to go for testing. We've also made um, our testing exercise a very, there's a lot of bureaucracy, there's a long waiting list, the turnaround times are even up to five days. And so we don't have enough testing capacity to manage this disease. I remember in the UK, they said no more testing. You have these symptoms, start on this and that. Perhaps it's time for us to go that way because uh, we, we are going to see, I think this is the space that we say we are going to have a surge. Our surge is now in this month of August, maybe September. So how do we prepare for this surge? How do we prepare a toll-free number where people can call for just psychological? Sometimes you just want someone to talk to. You don't necessarily require resources. But also how can we provide basic um, supplements uh, for the ones who can't afford the vitamin D, the vitamin C, the zinc supplements, the um, antibiotics where appropriate. Where can people get this for the ones who can't afford? Uh, Caroline, I think it's also a point to go back to some of the alternative medicines in terms of uh, therapies, not medicines, in terms of um, homemade remedies for managing flu. Uh, I don't know whether when you were growing up, you used to be uh, covered. You know, my mom used to, when you had a cold and a, a blocked nose, you know, she'd put this menthol leaves, I think they're eucalyptus leaves or the, there's a product, there's a tree we call marobaini, neem tree. Yes, I know, yes, I know it. 
We used to yeah. do that very well with a towel or a blanket. And exactly. And then you're covered. Yes. Yeah. So that helps to unblock. And I use that. Yeah. I use the, the, the unblocking bit because at some point I was uh, uh, stuffed. My nose was stuffed. Stuffy. Then um, things like the fruits, uh, things like ginger, crushed ginger, crushed uh, with honey and lemon and, you know, uh, turmeric. So there's some, some homemade remedies, of course, uh, taking into consideration that some of those things uh, may, make, may worsen conditions, health conditions or drugs that people may be taking. But generally, the day-to-day -day things that we've been taking for a common flu uh, really, really help and go a long way to alleviate the symptoms. The thing with COVID-19 is that you can't be static because one thing today, tomorrow, WHO has changed or CDC has changed guidelines. For example, the days of uh, discharging someone from hospital or from home-based care, it used to require a, a negative COVID test. And we had people who were in isolation for up to more than three weeks. Yeah, I can imagine my 12 days was a nightmare. What about three weeks? And those days, the government had a way of monitoring movements. So that, that has really brought the stigma. The other thing is the use of technology. I think we've not taken advantage of this in terms of uh, contact stressing, because many of the countries that have managed to have some sense of uh, flattening the curve have employed the use of technology and AI, artificial intelligence. Uh, here, we've not yet. We are still doing the old school, you know, calling and where are you? And can we come and see where you are? Uh, there's also the issue of um, those an app that's supposed to monitor. You're supposed to feed in how you're feeling. And, you know, it's, it's able to tell you, you know, at this temperature, maybe... Uh, call a healthcare provider. So that app, I tried downloading it, it didn't work. So it also means that um, sets or situations where we can give the power back to the individual. Yeah? Because at some point, our system is, it's already overwhelmed, let me not say at some point. It's already overwhelmed with inpatients. We can't take everyone in. And there are things that, or conditions that can be managed if you empower the individual with information, or with support, or with a place where they can quickly call and there's someone at the end of the line who will support them. And you're supporting from a positive side, not supporting of, oh, now you're positive, so I need to come and see and I need to ferry off your... I, I had a story of a friend whose mom turned positive and um, she was not, she didn't have any symptoms. So what happened is um, this guy's called and they said, you know what? Your mom is over 58 years. We are coming to take her to quarantine. So, you know, the family is like, but we can take care of our mother here in the house. We can do this and that. There's a space for isolation and whatnot. And it was almost like the policy says anyone above 58 goes into quarantine, which doesn't make sense because you're over the quarantine, but then you have to pay for them. And then secondly, you're going to overload the quarantine spaces with people who don't have symptoms, who don't need to be there. So just giving the power back to the individuals, the families, to ensure that uh, they're able to take care of the minor cases, they have a space where they can call and have follow-up, I think that will go a long way to demystifying, to offering hope rather than fear. Thank you so much. Oh, you have given us so much information and a lot of wisdom on how we can strengthen the health systems, but also work in collaboration with the community because the community has its own solutions and provides mm -hmm. solutions to addressing these issues and also working in collaboration with the local governments to make sure that we are not overburdening an already overburdened health system in the country. We thank you so much for making time to join us. We are so glad and thrilled to see that you are in good health and back at work. And we are just so happy that you are doing amazing things in the country. Again, fighting the stigma associated with COVID-19 and educating people from a personal point of view and also from your role as a health system strengthening specialist. Thank you so much, Dr. Elizabeth. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, as we come to the end of our segment today,
we invite you to subscribe to our show, the NGO Whisperer channel on YouTube and like us on our pages on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on Twitter and Instagram. And we look forward to bringing you more stories like this because it's all about connecting people, raising funds and impacting lives globally.